Right, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to the new lecture series, okay, for the 2024 GC O level social studies uh, syllabus. Okay, so if your syllabus is the one that's new, that's uh, first year of exam 2024 and beyond, okay, uh, then this would probably be the video for you. Okay, so let's go straight into it, all right. Uh, unit one, as always, we talk about attributes of citizenship so if you remember okay citizenship is all about the idea of what it means to be a part of a nation okay citizens of course as we all know we come to be very familiar with this term okay citizens being uh, a member of this nation so in this unit we'll ask ourselves okay what exactly does it mean to be a citizen of a nation okay and this will be our framework Okay, and uh, units that we'll go through for, for uh, the entire syllabus. Okay, so the first aspect of citizenship will be what we call legal status. Okay, and the legal status, basically the lawful way of calling yourself a citizen so is of course uh, through uh, getting that citizenship in the first place. Okay, so we're going to look at how can one person get citizenship in Singapore. Okay, so generally, if you are born in Singapore to Singapore parents, okay, you are a Singapore citizen by right. Okay, this right comes from the law of the blood or in Latin, jus sanguinis. Okay, which is essentially the idea that you are born in our territory to parents of this citizen. Uh, they are citizens of this nation. Okay, you automatically get the citizenship by right. Okay. So it is granted by descent. So your parents being a certain citizen, you also get their citizenship. And many other countries practice the same thing as well. Okay, Some countries, okay, they do practice something called jasoli, which is the law of the soil. Okay, This is when uh, so long as you are born on this country's territory, you are the citizen of this country. Okay, So one example of this is United States. Okay, So if you're born on American soil, you are legally an American citizen, okay? No matter if your parents are American or not, okay? So what then is a permanent resident? So a PR, okay, is a resident but not a citizen, okay? So at the same time, they get to live permanently, as the name suggests, in this particular country, okay? But they will not be able to enjoy all the rights associated with being a citizen, at the same time, they will also not need to do all the responsibilities, okay, that is required of a citizen. Okay, so as of 2023, these are uh, the ways that somebody who is not born a citizen can actually apply for Singapore citizenship. So uh, if you're born outside Singapore territory to at least one Singaporean parent, then yes, uh, if you register your birth, then yes, you will be a Singapore citizen. Uh, a female, okay, specifically female foreigner marrying a Singapore citizen after being a PR for at least two years is eligible for Singapore citizenship. So not automatically, yeah, you still have to go through the process of application, okay, and that comes on top of the PR application in the first place. Okay, so two steps, uh, first you got to be a PR, then can you ever apply for citizenship? Okay, there's no straight away become citizen. Okay, and the last way is of course by what we call registration. Okay, it used to be called naturalization, but nowadays it's called registration. Okay, so uh, this person over the age of 21 must be residing in Singapore for at least 10 of the prior 12 years uh, to registration. So this is the whole process of uh, literally, uh, sorry, applying, okay, directly for citizenship. Uh, obviously, you got to go through the entire process of becoming a PR first in order to stay in Singapore. Right? So again, it is still a two-step process. Okay? And another requirement for, for citizens that come to Singapore and they want to become a Singapore citizen is that they must rescind any prior citizenship. Okay? The word rescind basically means I have to uh, basically let go okay, of a previous citizen, uh, citizenship. Okay? And yeah, this also applies for PRs. Okay, when they are converting to Singapore citizens. Okay, so if say they have a, a, a citizenship of say Malaysia, 
okay, and they wish to become a Singapore citizen after living in Singapore as a PR, then they will have to uh, forego okay, their Malaysian citizenship. Okay, so why do you think this requirement exists and what are some possible reasons that somebody wants to rescind their citizenship? Okay, uh, obviously, uh, the most glaring reason would be that uh, it would be this in this ingenuous okay to have somebody who is uh having allegiances towards two different nations at once okay in singapore's eyes that is simply not possible if you're going to be a citizen of singapore you're going to go it the full way okay which is why uh you have to forego of all that citizen and other citizenship somebody who makes that decision okay likely are already living in that country or moving to that country for very specific reasons, be it for uh, marriage, be it for a uh, better life, for example, better standard of living. Okay, it really depends. So it's not a decision that is lightly made, I think, okay, for most people. Okay, but it is a decision that many, many, many people take on a daily basis. And of course, uh, we are not the only uh, country in the world that requires... Uh, uh, rescinding previous citizenship. Some countries do allow what we call dual or even uh, multi-citizenship. Okay, this is when a person has uh, multiple citizenships of different nations. Some countries do allow that, okay, but not in Singapore. Okay, uh, the other part, which is, remember we said rights, right? So a citizen has the rights of that particular nationality, okay, and the rights actually come from what we call the constitution. Okay, the constitution is the supreme law of the land. Okay, so this is the highest law. This is the law that sets out everything that we know of as the country. Okay, so in a democracy like Singapore, uh, where we elect our leaders and the leaders form the government, okay, uh, the authority that they get is actually not unlimited. Okay, so they have to act according to a piece of legislation known as the constitution. Okay, so just like any uh, school, any club, okay, all every one of these will have a founding document and a document that contains maybe uh, in certain cases rules or in other cases the, the uh, leaders, how the leadership is elected in each of these societies. Same thing for countries, okay? So Singapore has a constitution just like any other country in the world. And so the constitution acts as the source of government power Okay, it tells us what are the organs of government, uh, which in this case is the legislature, executive, and judiciary, which is what we will uh, cover in the next lesson. Okay, at the same time, it also includes provision to limit the government's power. Okay, because of what we call safeguards. So these safeguards actually make sure that power is separated. By separated, we mean that not one person or one group holds all the power in this nation. Okay, so we make sure that different groups of people, different organs actually carry uh, a certain degree of power such that uh, it is not consolidated, it is not just held by one place, one person, one entity alone. Okay, so the constitution also guarantees the rights of citizens. Okay, so if you are a citizen of this country, the government is obligated to uh, follow and protect uh, the rights, okay, of any citizen uh, uh, of this nation. Okay, so these are the rights of Singapore citizens. Okay, so uh, liberty, so not being unlawfully detained, uh, no slavery and forced labour, okay, except for national service, okay, protection against retrospective criminal law, so uh, you cannot be punished more than once for the same crime, okay, equal protection of the law, Okay, so everybody, no matter what your race, language, religion, or background is, you will be treated equally before the law. Okay, so nobody's above the law. Uh, freedom of movement. Okay, so every citizen of Singapore has the right to move freely throughout Singapore and in live in any part of Singapore. Of course, except uh, if you're restricted, uh, for in the case of like uh, prisons and prisoners. Uh, every Singapore citizen has the right to uh, freedom of speech, assembly, and association. Please ignore the typo on the table there. Okay, so this basically means that uh, Singapore citizens are allowed to uh, say whatever they like to say without uh, being uh, pressured. Okay, they are able to assemble in groups and they are able to have associations to societies and political parties uh, without repercussions. Of course, 
are subject to the condition that they are not out there to disrupt national security, uh, say through uh, spreading fake news or things like uh, rioting. Okay, so that would be the certain restrictions there. Okay, freedom of religion. So everybody in Singapore has the right to profess a certain religion and practice this religion peacefully and also to uh, propagate and expand this religion. <clears throat> And of course, uh, right in respect of education, so we treat education very seriously. Okay, so this article states that no student, okay, or no citizen will be discriminated on any grounds when it comes to the administration of any educational institution. So, uh, religion, descent, race cannot be affected when it comes to uh, education opportunities, assessment, and stuff like that. Okay, so uh. Generally, okay, these are the rights given to citizens by the nation. Okay, uh, there are of course uh, more universal rights. Okay, and this is what we call the human rights. Okay, so a type of human right is actually uh, the rights of a child, which uh, by right any country that signed the convention on the right of the child will need to follow and protect the rights of minors, which is anybody below uh, the age of 18. Okay, so you can see all the things on the screen there. Okay, and last but not least, the Singapore Constitution also sets up what we call the Presidential Council for Minority Rights or PCMR. We'll see this later on uh, in the series. Okay, this <coughs> body essentially examines all the laws passed by Parliament. Okay, and they basically ensure that the law does not disadvantage any racial or religious groups specifically. Okay, so yeah, it basically keeps the legislature, the people making the laws in check. Okay, as a citizen, there's legally a citizen that is, we're talking about that. Okay, not only are we protected, but of course, in a social contract system, okay, when we get protection, we are also expected to perform certain responsibilities, okay, to, to the nation. So everybody has the responsibility of following the law, not discriminating in Singapore, okay? While we value our rights, we also need to exercise sensitivity. We also need to exercise safety, okay, when exercising our rights. So even though we have a right to do something, doesn't mean anything and everything that technically falls under that right should be done, okay? For example, some people may say, oh, uh, you shouldn't uh, shout fire in a crowded building because that might cause a stampede and cause people to die even though there's no emergency at all. So, is shouting fire part of freedom of speech? Technically, yes, you could argue that. But at the same time, should we do it? Of course not. It puts other people in danger for nothing. Okay, so when we exercise rights responsibly, we can actually form a harmonious society. But at the same time, if we abuse our rights, it may cause problems, tensions, frictions, and so discord in our society which is something that we do not want, okay? <clears throat> so, identity and shared values, okay? So we talk about the legal status of citizenship. Now, another way that we can look at whether or not somebody is a citizen of a particular nation is whether they have the identity of that, nation, of that nationality, okay? Part of that comes with whether or not this person has uh, assimilated and has taken up some of the shared values that is valued in this particular nation. Okay, and this is where we talk about the common national identity. Okay, so this is when everybody, regardless of whatever makes us different, all have a shared belief in something. Okay, so shared national values are the values that are shared by a majority of the nation. Okay, so when I feel like I am part of this nation, by identity, if we're looking at citizenship by identity, when I feel like I'm part of the nation, when I practice things that make me part of this nation in terms of what we believe in together, that is what makes us a citizen. Not only the legal status of, say, holding a passport or an IC makes me a citizen, but whether I really truly believe and act like I believe that I'm belonging to this nation. Okay, so I can have an uh, IC Okay, but I don't care about Singapore at all. That is possible. And some people will argue that that does not make them a true citizen. Sometimes they just get the citizenship 
for benefit themselves and they don't want to benefit other people they don't want to feel like they're connected to this land that they supposedly call home okay and that is where uh, the argument for identity as a factor of citizenship arises okay so in singapore things like the national pledge celebrating national day will give rise to that common national identity okay and it is this identity that also allows people to care for their countrymen it also allows people to have pride okay and allegiance to this country so if i don't feel like i'm part of this country then what's the point of me protecting this country if today touch wood uh, war breaks out okay will i really go and protect this country against all invaders that's the question so some people argue identity okay and willingness to be a part of this nation is the most important factor okay and the last possible way we can look at people's uh, nationality or whether or not they are citizen of this nation is through civic participation okay that we're talking about participation in public affairs so essentially public affairs are what concerns society okay so this can be uh areas like uh law this can be areas like environment politics uh, education uh community support uh, helping the poor all these are what we call public affairs and citizens okay uh, under this definition citizens are the one that actually actively contribute to society okay by contributing to society they actually have a level of ownership and commitment to this society this nation that they call home okay and so that that's why people use that as a gauge of citizenship so this can be done as part of individuals this can be done as part of informal groups or even formal groups okay so uh, i'm not going to list all the examples here okay but i am going to tell you that there are three different categories individuals of course we're talking about things that we do as a person as an individual person informal groups are groups that are from civil society okay so this can be uh, things that are not necessarily formally established but you come together say a group of friends that meet up every week to go and pick up rubbish that will be an informal group formal groups are ones that are actually formally acknowledged and actually put into establishment through the law so these are your registered societies okay so organizations like your uh be, uh your your aware uh like your um spca all these things are actually registered societies so those are what we call formal groups okay so anybody who wants to participate in public affairs can do so in any of these three categories okay so the three ways like i said to measure or rather to assess whether somebody is a citizen a whether they are legal citizens through legal status so whether they hold uh their legal documents whether they are actually renouncing other nation citizenship and stuff like that we talk about whether they feel and act like they actually belong to this nation that is identity whether they share a common national identity and the last one is whether or not they contribute actively to this nation that they call home okay and that will be the three factors that you need to know for this chapter okay thank you very much people for listening okay all the best and i'll see you guys in the next lecture okay bye bye